Uh, I absolutely love being a biker. You know, if those of you who ride, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you know, there's an old biker saying that says, if I have to explain it, you wouldn't understand. Okay. If you don't experience it yourself, I mean, you might try to understand. You just, you just can't understand it. I've had some people say, but, but wait, aren't motorcycles dangerous? Yeah, they, they are dangerous, but you want to know what the most dangerous part of a motorcycle is? Most dangerous part of a motorcycle is the nut connecting the seat to the handlebars. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, every, every, everybody would agree with that. So, <laughs> Oh, we also have another one here. I Googled my symptoms. Turns out I just needed to go ride. A lot of truth to that as well. It's the best therapy I've ever had. Love, uh, love riding. When you're too old to ride your Harley, you get a walker with ape hangers. Okay? So I'm uh, already thinking that. And I've got, a, got another one here. How's it going to? Oh, one second. Now, you know, I looked at that and I'm like, you know, maybe when I first started riding, when I was young, I'd probably be all over that. But at 55, um, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I would do that. My mom hollers at me enough for how fast I drive. Imagine if she saw me on one of those. So, <laughs> oh, anyway, a few weeks ago, I was talking with a fellow biker that I'm uh, distantly related to. His name is Mike, and uh, he's also a pastor. And so, you know, we have uh, have the, pastor, the pastoring in common. We have motorcycles in common. He also likes Star Trek. And so, like, he's like the ultimate friend. He's into, into Jesus, motorcycles, and Star Trek. You know, I mean, what more could there possibly be? Um, coffee, yes. He, he also likes coffee. <laughs> but anyway, I was chatting with Mike, and... Um, he had another uh, acquaintance of mine named Dave there. Um, he'd mentioned that Dave had just started riding. And, of course, so we started talking bikes and found out that Dave had gotten himself a, a 750. It was a little older model, but, you know, nice shape, and he's really enjoying getting into riding and stuff like that. Well, then Mike mentioned to Dave, he's like, oh, yeah, he said, uh, I'll see if I can find someone to, uh, to get that junk out of your driveway that's been parked there for so long. And I kind of looked at, uh, at Mike a little questioningly, and he's like, oh, he said, well, about a year ago, a um, year and a half ago, he said, Dave and I were talking, and Dave was talking about wanting to, wanting to ride. He said, and I had this old bike parked in the garage, or parked in the barn. He said, it was running when I parked it back in 2012, but it wouldn't start. And Dave was interested in maybe getting the bike and fixing it up, so I told Dave he could have it. So he gave the bike to Dave, and, and Dave was talking. He's like, yeah, he said, but I, he said, I finally had to take it to a, to a motorcycle garage, and he said they looked it over, and it was going to be uh, four or $500 to fix. He said, I just really didn't want to put that money into it. He's like, so I'm kind of done with it. You know, I, I tried, and I worked on it. Uh, and he said, besides, it's an 1100. It's, it's really too big for me right now. And, and uh, so Mike's plan was to find somebody who'd come and would take it for scrap. And so I looked at him, I said, you interested in selling it? He's like, why, you want it? I said, yeah, I've always wanted a project bike. You know, just I've never taken the step to get one. Always wanted a project bike. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, if you want it, it's yours. You can have it. I said, are you serious? He's like, yeah, you take it. You can have it. And so about a week later, uh, a coworker of mine that has a trailer, it's always good to have friends with trailers and trucks, right? Yeah. Yeah, a coworker of mine with a trailer went with me down to Tioga. We, we put the bike on the trailer, and I brought it home. So I've got a, got a project bike sitting in my basement right now. And uh, The thing about the bike is when we were approaching Dave's house to, uh, to pick up the bike, the bike was sitting outside, and uh, it had been sitting in Dave's driveway for a little over a year. So it had been parked in a barn since 2012 until a little over a year ago when Dave got it, and then it had been parked out in a driveway. Now, when I first rounded the corner and I looked at it parked there, I'm like, hey, that didn't, doesn't look too bad. You know, it was a 1988 Honda Shadow 1100, you know, from a distance, 
you know, I mean, looks like an 88, but doesn't really look all that bad. But then I got a little closer. I started to see that there were some issues. You know, you can see a little bit of rust there and, and a couple other places, and that actually looks like uh, like green lichen almost <laughs> right there on the bike. You know, you come on this side, and there's, again, a little, uh, little rusty and some spots and, and uh, you know, definitely some rust there on the highway peg and, um, you know, no, uh, no battery. Well, there is a battery box there, but that's almost rusted out. That's uh, definitely going to need to be replaced. No battery, no air box. Uh, and definitely the aluminum needs a ton of work, okay? So, um, yeah, this is a bike that uh, at one, de- one time was somebody's pride and joy. When Mike first got that bike, he bought it used, but when he first got that bike, oh, he loved, I mean, the smile on his face, those, here, those of us here that own motorcycles, you know how you feel when you get a new bike, Right? or a new-to-you bike. It's exciting. You want to go out. All you want to do is ride. I, heck, even on an old bike, I, all I want to do is ride it. But, you know, we love to ride with that excitement of a new bike, and, and he had it for several years. But then he got a different bike. Lost interest. Parked it in the barn. And there it sat. Ignored. Oh, yeah, I'm sure he'd walk by it in the barn every now and then and look at it, maybe smile at the fun times that he had on the bike over the years, but he had a different bike. You know, you got a Honda VTX 1800. Oh, nice bike, really nice. A huge, it's basically, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, it's basically a, a huge motor with two wheels, okay? <laughs> it's just, it's basically what it is, uh, just a motor with wheels and a uh, really nice bike, and so he's, Spending all this time with that, ignored this bike and got to the point where it didn't run anymore. And it got to the point where it didn't really have any value to Mike. He gave it away. And the guy that got it was excited, I'm sure, when he got it, but then started to get really disappointed because he couldn't get it to run on his own and It's going to cost more than what he wanted to spend to fix it up. So this bike that was once somebody's pride and joy, that probably even turned some heads, you know, in new shape, that's a good-looking bike. Honda Shadows are really good-looking bikes. I'm sure it turned some heads. But now it's just a bunch of rusted metal. He wanted to scrap it. He probably would have been excited if the guy that came to scrap it gave him a couple hundred bucks. You know, I've met some people like that. People that maybe at one time seemed to have it all. Bright future ahead of them. Maybe had a great job, a great family. Following their dream only to end up broken down and rusted like this Honda Shadow. Once they were dearly loved, but then they were left in a barn to rot. For some of these people, it might seem like there's no hope. He might feel worthless, ready for the scrap heap. Who would possibly be interested in an old, broken down, rusty bike like me? But I want to let you know that just like abandoned, rusted, broken down bikes can be cherished and restored, people can be too. You see, when I look at that Honda Shadow sitting in my basement right now, I don't see what it is. I see what it has the potential to become. You know, that rust can be taken out. That chrome, 
I could be taken care of too. I mean, I, some of the rusty chrome, I could probably just use the old uh, tin foil and Coke trick if I wanted to, or some, you know, triple lot, uh, yeah. Where, uh, Brillo pad or uh, stainless, uh, yeah, stainless steel, triple out stainless steel pad there. Yeah, I'll take some of that off with a little soapy water. I mean, there's ways to get rust off chrome. And if that doesn't work, I could send it away to get re-chromed if I wanted to or find a new chrome part online or, or use one that looks really good. There's ways to take care of that rust. That dirty aluminum casing, yeah, I got some stuff at home that'll polish aluminum, probably polish that right up. With the right stuff, I could take that aluminum and almost make it a mirror finish again. I could repaint it. Would I leave it purple? I don't know. Kind of like it purple. But maybe I could do something else. I don't know. The sky's the limit. That bike that right now looks like trash, with time, with effort, can easily be turned into a treasure. And that's my goal. In fact, my goal is next year's Biker Sunday, I want to be riding that bike. Now, it might not be fully restored at that point, but I want it to be running. He told me what was wrong with it that kept it from running. I guess it's, they call it a CDI box. It's kind of like a mini computer for the, for the motorcycle. And he said, yeah, it's going to cost me about you know $400 to get that CDI box. And I don't know, I'm a nerd, I'm into computers I got online and I found them for a lot less than that. So, and it's something I can fix myself, I think. I'm not a mechanic, but uh, yeah, I think I can handle it. If not, I know enough people who are mechanics that could help me with it, all right? And if you're one of those people that feels like my bike is right now, I wanna let you know that God looks at you the same way somebody like me looks at those old, rusted, broken down, seemingly worthless bikes. God doesn't see you like you are. God sees you according to the potential you have to become. In fact, you know what the Bible says that God considers you? He considers you his child. We are the children of God. Most of us in this room are parents. A couple of you aren't. But if those of you who aren't probably will be someday. I mean, chances are, okay? Um, but for those of us who are parents, let me ask you this. Is there anything your child could ever do to make you not love them? Absolutely not. I will always love my kids. Now, do they make mistakes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're my children. What do you think? <laughs> you know, of course they make mistakes. They make a lot of mistakes sometimes. Oh, but they're good kids. And if they mess up, am I going to look at them as like, wow, you flubbed your dub. I'm done. Forget it. Come back to me when you've cleaned your act up. I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that. No loving parent would ever say that. No, we might not approve of what, we're, what they're doing. We might not be proud of what they're doing. We might even be ashamed of what they're doing. But the love never stops. The love never stops. There's nothing my children could ever do to make me not love them. And I'm a flawed human. Imagine our Heavenly Father with us. You can't mess up enough where God won't love you. And just like a child who's made a mistake, who's gone down the wrong path, calls out to their parent, Dad, will you help me? Of course we'll help you because that's what parents do. And God the Father will answer your call as well. This whole process of restoring something broken and, and rusted and seemingly worthless reminds me of a story from Scripture. And those of you who are familiar with your Bible, you know this story. Those of you that hung around church for any, any amount of time, I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, it's the story of the prodigal son, and we find it in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son had it all. He lost it felt alone, abandoned, and worthless. And then he was restored. So going to Luke chapter 15, we're going to go ahead and, and read his story here. 
Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So here's what's happening here. This son went to his dad, and here's what he basically said. Dad, I know when you die, I'm going to get some inheritance. But, you know, I don't want to wait for you to die. Give me what's coming to me now. Talk about arrogance. I mean, I know if I went to my dad right now and said, I don't want to wait for you to die. Give me what's coming to me. He's like, oh, I will gladly give you what's coming to you. Come here, boy. (laughs) You know what I mean? You don't say that to your parents. How rude. How uncaring. Just, I don't know. I, I just, I can't imagine a child going to their parent and saying something like this. But in this story, that's exactly what the son did. And to top it off, what does it say? The father divided his property between them. He had two sons. He's like, all right, well, let's go ahead and do it. Now, as you read along in the story, it's impl- it doesn't specifically say, but it's implied that this dad was pretty wealthy. He had a lot. And he divided up the inheritance. Now, back in those days, an inheritance was more than just cash. Wealth back then was also measured in like how much livestock you had. How many sheep, how many cattle, how many camels, how many what, whatever you, kind of animals you had, you know, your crops, your, your property, all this stuff. And so the dad divided everything between his two sons. Moving along, verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So it says not long after that, meaning you know, it took a little bit of time because the son would have to take the property that he received, the livestock that were his, and sell it to get cash. Because you know, his attitude was, I can't wait to get out of this podunk town. You know, a lot of people feel like I, I've grown up in Tioga County. I've never lived anywhere other than Tioga County. Done a lot of traveling never lived anywhere other than the county that I currently reside in, and I would be perfectly fine dying in Tioga County. And my wife says if I don't straighten up, no, I'm kidding, she didn't. (laughs) Although there was one day when we were having a discussion that she looked me square in the eye and said, remember when I said, till death do we part? And I said, yes, ma'am. Whew. Yeah. Back down in a hurry. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, so he had to sell this property, got the cash, left town, and said he went off into a distant country and squandered it on wild living. In other words, he partied it away. Went to one of the hot spots, you know, like you think in your mind of like, you know, if you wanted to go somewhere, you know, another country somewhere and just party. You know, there's probably places you could think of that, you know, some Caribbean island, uh, you know, where you could go to the beach and just, you know, do whatever, or maybe, you know, Paris or Milan, or there's all kinds of places around the world that you could go, and it says he partied it all away. See, because here's one of the issues. This is kind of a little side note. One One of the issues that a lot of people run into is when they suddenly get a lot of money, they're very irresponsible with it. Like, you ever notice how many times when people win the lottery, it's not too long before they're broke. You know, the Bible says that if you are responsible with a little, God will give you a little bit more. And they'll give you a little bit more if you're responsible with what you got. And they'll give a little bit more than that. If you can't handle $20, you're not going to be able to handle $20,000. If you can't handle $50,000, $50,000, you're not going to be able to handle $50 million. And that's what he did. He went, went to this far off country and, oh man, I got all this money and started partying. And, you know, he was the one that bought all the drinks at the bar, bought, bought all the food. Oh, it's on me, guys. I bet he had all kinds of friends until the money ran out. Then he discovered they weren't friends at all. Once he stopped buying, they stopped hanging out, it was gone. You know, there's 
nothing necessarily wrong with having a good time. I mean, I like going to parties, but I can guarantee you the kind of parties I like to have are very different than the kind of parties he held. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I promise you, I can have just as much fun, if not more, and I'll feel fine the next morning. You know, if I'm driving home after that party, I don't have to worry about getting pulled over. The worst I'll get is a speeding ticket. You know, I'll pass any field sobriety test. Now, I'm not worried about that. That's, you know, not interested in that kind of partying anymore. But verse 14 says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So one day, this spoiled rich kid woke up and realized that all the money was gone. And to top it off, there was a severe famine in the land. Now, to put this in modern terms, he woke up and he discovered he was broke and the economy had crashed. I am so glad we've never had to worry about that, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> no, I mean, we kind of get it, okay? We, we, we kind of get it. And then it says the only job he could find was on a pig farm. Now, at first glance, that didn't sound like a really bad deal at all. I mean, we have a lot of pig farms around this area, okay? I've know, known several people that have worked at pig farms. I've known a couple of people that have owned pig farms, you know? Not, a, not really a bad job if you don't mind smelling really bad. <laughs> I walked into a pig barn once just, you know, with a farmer and, and we just kind of looked around. I wasn't in there for 10 minutes. And I came out and my wife informed me I was not going in the house with those clothes on my back because I just see 10 minutes in that pig barn and it's like, whoa. Just, you know, that, that, that hung with you, okay? So other than the smell... Wasn't bad money, wasn't bad work. But to Jewish people, it's a little different because according to the law that God gave Moses, pigs were considered unclean. They were not allowed to eat pork. No pork chops, no bacon, you know, no, no uh, pork tenderloin, you know, none of that good stuff. It's just God said, no, you're not to eat that. And so in the, the Jewish community, they grew up despising pork. In fact, if you even touched a pig or touched anything made of pig skin, like, you know, somebody threw you a, a football that was made of pig skin and you touched it, you were considered unclean, unable to participate in religious rituals for a certain period of time. To kind of give you an idea of how they felt about pigs back then, think about this. Like, there are countries in the world today where it is normal for people to eat dogs, right? We know that. There's some countries where people will eat dogs. Now, if I invited you over to my house and said, you know, I've got a real fresh Labrador on the grill, you want to come over, would you come over and eat? No. would be like, that's disgusting. I'd never eat a dog. That's how Jewish people felt about pigs. Now, I've never eaten a dog. Don't care if I ever do. It's not on my bucket list. But I'm sure the people that do, do it because they taste good. They might. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to, there's plenty of other food that tastes good that I'll eat. So I could go to a Jewish person. I'm like, oh, man, there's nothing like bacon. Oh, bacon. Thank God there's a new covenant and we can eat bacon, you know. <laughs> oh. Uh, and they're like, you know, I don't care. It's, it's gross. It's disgusting. I don't care what you say. So he got a job working with pigs, disgusted. He was con continuously unclean. Now, at that point, he wasn't in a right relationship with God, so it probably didn't matter a whole lot, but in the back of his mind, he's like, I shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. This is wrong. Shouldn't be doing this. And it said that he got so hungry that he looked at the food that he was feeding the pigs and wanted to eat it. Now, I've seen what pigs get. Can you imagine being so hungry that you'd look at the food that the pigs are eating and you're like, oh, man, that looks good. Wow, I've got to get me some of that. Oh, man. He was in a desperate situation. He hit rock bottom, and he knew it was nobody's fault but his own. He was the one that put him 
where he was. He was the one that made the bad choices that made him end up all alone in a foreign country feeding pigs and barely surviving. He knew it. And you know what? There's a lot of us that can relate to that. We've put ourselves in rock bottom. We've all made stupid choices. I have a PhD in stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, you know, I can make stupid choices all day long if I don't stop and think about what I'm doing. And stupid choices have consequences, don't they? And maybe those stupid choices that we've made put us in places that we never dreamed we would be. Maybe in a job that we absolutely despise, but they're the only company around that'll hire a felon. So I gotta work. Maybe it's caused our relationships to end, a marriage to end, a partner to leave. I've known people who've owned their mistakes, but it was too late. They've already alienated their children. Their kids want nothing to do with them. And they know why. They said, you know, my, my bad choices caused that. And they're in that situation and they're hopeless. He probably thought, you know, I'm just worthless. Sitting in this corner of the barn, all alone, broke, I have no value. Why in the world would my father want to do anything for me? Verse 17. When he came to his senses, I love that line. <laughs> when he came to his senses, the light bulb came on. He said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So as he's wallowing in his despair, he thinks, you know, the people that work for my dad have more than enough. He pays them well. He pays them fairly. They have food to spare. He says, so I'm going to go home and I'm going to beg my dad. You know, dad, I know I messed up. I know I shamed you. I know I made all kinds of choices I shouldn't have made. And I'm not asking for anything other than a job. Dad, would you please just, just give me a job? Could, could I be one of your employees? I'm not asking for anything special. Just could I have a job? You know, that wallowing in that despair before the light comes on. Again, it's not a good place to be. Many of us have been there. And sometimes we feel like there's no hope. There's no way out. And sometimes that despair that we're wallowing in, that barn that we find ourselves parked in the corner of, has gone on so long that it's become normal. It's what we're used to. And we don't want to change. Sooner or later, we hit that rock bottom, and this is what this son did. Verse 20 says, So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Picture this in your mind. The son is getting close to home. And where's the father? He's out in front of his house and he looks up and he sees somebody coming. I wonder who that is. And then suddenly he realizes it's his son. The son that said, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. Give me my inheritance now. The son that sold off the property and the livestock and the other things that his dad worked so hard to obtain 
took it all in cash and ran off and partied it away. Like half what his dad had worked so hard to get was gone because this son that was walking down the road left and partied it away. And you know, a lot of people would not have thought anything bad about that dad if he'd have just went, (laughs) turned around, went back into the house and locked the door. You made your bed, you sleep in it, boy. A lot of people wouldn't have blamed him at all, but that's not what he did. When he realized it was his son, what's it say he did? He ran toward him. He wasn't going to wait for his son to come to him. He ran toward his son, hugged him, kissed him. And when his son finally said, I'm not worthy to be called your son, basically what he said was, forget that, you're my son. And he told his servants, bring a robe, bring a ring. Robes and rings back then were symbols of status and authority. By bringing the robe and bringing the ring, what he was doing is he was restoring his son back to the position of second born. Back to where he was before he left. And then he told the servants, hey, go kill that fattened calf. In other words, you know, slaughter that, that, uh, that cattle over there, you know, butcher it, and we're going to have a party. That, that's going to be the meat for the party. Okay? And he held this party for his son. And, and, and he's like, you know, you were lost and now you're found. You came back home. And and I'm sure that the son was confused. He's like, what? After all I've done? The dad's like, no, 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 no. You're my son. Do you understand that? You're my son, and I love you. And just like the prodigal son was restored from his broken and rusted place in life, God does the same for us. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. You could have committed some of the most heinous crimes that a human being could commit. But I'll tell you what you can't do. You can't out the grace of God. There is nothing you could ever do that will make God love you less. There is nothing you could ever do that God will not forgive if you are sorry. Now, that doesn't mean that I can go out and do whatever I want and then tell God I'm sorry later. No, no, no. We've all made apologies that we really didn't mean. Okay? I have a little sister. Pray for her. There's nothing wrong with her. She's just my sister, and she needs all the prayer she can get. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I would harass her growing up. And, uh, and of course, what, she, what would she do? She'd go and she'd tell on me, Mom, Dad, Harry's picking on me. They'd tell me, tell your sister you're sorry. Well, I wasn't sorry. As soon as they left the room, I was going to get her back for ratting on me. You know what I mean? But I knew if I didn't apologize, I'd get in trouble. So what would I do? I'd look at my sister and I'd go, I'm sorry. Well, everybody knew that I wasn't, I wasn't sorry at all. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. I did do it again a few times. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's what brothers do. But we can't go to God with that attitude. Like, yeah, God will forgive me, so I'm going to go out and do all this stuff. And then I'm going to, eh, it doesn't quite work like that. You really need to be sorry. You need to mean it. God, I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. I'm really sorry. Please forgive me. Help me to not do it again. And I tell you, one of the struggles that I used to have is, you know, we all have areas in our life that we struggle with. I still have areas in my life that I struggle with. Now, what I struggle with now is very different than what I struggled with years ago. My struggles sometimes change over the years. But there have been a couple that have hung with me my whole life. And I've gone to God countless times and said, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Help me to never do this again. I promise, God, I'll never do this again. But what do I find myself doing again? Same stupid thing. I find myself going back to God. God, hey me again. I did it again. Makes me feel worthless. How could God love me? After over and over and over and over and over again, I've told him I was sorry and I would never do it again and I did it again. But I promise you, God loves you. He wants to restore you. But Pastor Harry, you don't know what I've done. You're right, maybe I don't. But I do know this. God loves you and wants to restore you. 
Even if you're a Christian and have messed up, God loves you and wants to restore you. For, for those of you in this room who, who follow Jesus, you know, just something here to, to think about. You know, what does the word Christian mean? It means little Christ. It was originally an insult against some of the early Christians. Uh, you know, the, the people who weren't Christians, oh, you're just little Christ. And they took it as a badge of honor, meaning, yeah, I act just like Jesus. I call myself a Christian. I've been a Christian for 40 years. I don't always act like Jesus. Quite often, I find myself really not responding like Jesus would. I'm still broken. Still got some rust that needs to be worked out. Still have some carburetors that need to be cleaned. I'm still embarrassed about some of the junk that I deal with. But I know in my heart of hearts that if I go to my heavenly father and I say, God, I'm sorry, help me to become the person you want me to be, that God will receive me with open arms just like he re- the, the, son of the, prodig- uh, the father of the prodigal son received him. So this morning, as you examine where you are in life, I want you to remember, God doesn't look at you like you are. God looks at you like you can be, like he wants you to be, like he will help you to become. You just need to turn yourself over to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. It just, it blows my mind Lord, the love that you have for us, your eagerness to restore us to even better than we were before. And I pray, Lord, right now that you would speak to all of our hearts. You you know where we are. You know what needs to change in our lives. And I pray that you would speak to us and let us know what we need to start working on. Help us, Lord, to have the courage to come before you and to give it all to you. Give us the strength, Lord, that we need to walk in victory. Surround us with the kind of people that we need to encourage us, to help us along this journey. In Jesus' name we pray.